You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, I'm your host Uzma Jafri with another episode of South Asia Focus. Let's begin the show. India and Nepal, the two countries who have shared a strong diplomatic and cultural camaraderie for decades, seem to have a new common friend. Chinese President Xi Jinping was on a visit to both the countries to strengthen Beijing's ties with both New Delhi and Kathmandu. While it was an informal summit with Prime Minister Narendra Modi, where the nuances of engagement were not disclosed to media, a host of agreements were signed with Nepal, which is now a part of China's ambitious Belt and Road Initiative. A report. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Chinese President Xi Jinping relieved the camaraderie in southern India town of Malapuram, which had been established last year in Chinese city of Wuhan. The two sides hope the two leaders to build further their personal rapport established at the first such informal summit. The meeting was primarily held to reorganize a relationship that was marked by a series of events hurting Indian interests. While Beijing had nearly towed the Pakistani line of going against India, its trade deficit was widening with New Delhi. The two leaders took an eco-friendly ride in an electric rickshaw to the seaside beach hut at Machan, a Taj Fisherman's Cove in Kovalam, a fishing hamlet where the one-to-one -one talks were held. Not much came out of the meeting, but it was conveyed afterwards that in the line of the growing terrorism threats, both the sides discussed over deepening defence ties with each other. President Xi raised the issue of engaging more on the defence and security side. He said that uh, there was a brief review of the uh, ongoing exchanges and cooperation, after which the President of China said we need to step up engagement in this area. This will enhance mutual trust between the two militaries and the security forces. And they have extended an invitation to the Rakshamantri, our defence minister, uh, to visit China. The meet, which was overloaded with symbolism, also comprised the gift exchange between the two leaders. The mark of goodwill came following bilateral talks between the pair to try to hold a slight in ties over the disputed Himalayan region of Kashmir amid scattered anti-China protests from Tibetan groups. Bilateral trade between China and India touched 89.6 billion US dollars in 2017 2018, with the trade deficit widening to 62.9 billion US dollars in China's favor. There was a good conversation on trade. As you know, this is an issue which has been of concern here back home. And President Xi Jinping, after hearing out our Prime Minister on this issue, said that, he, that China is ready to take sincere action in this regard and to discuss in a very concrete way how to reduce the trade deficit. She received a grant welcome in Nepalese capital Kathmandu as children and adults queued alongside city road and waved Chinese flags upon his arrival. They greeted him in conventional Nepalese style. The two countries have agreed to align the Belt and Road Initiative with Nepal's national development strategy of building itself a land-linked country. While more than two dozen agreements were signed between two sides, the principal focus of China has been to make deep inroads in Himalayan town for the successful materialization of its Belt and Road Initiative. Critics have, however, cast their aspersions on Chinese intention, saying that it is Beijing's modus operandi to invest heavily in countries with small economy and then trap with their dead. Moving on to resource-rich Balochistan, where Pakistan's Gholish army has touched a new low in achieving its satanic ambitions. Unable to suppress the Baloch political movement, which has gained momentum of late, Pakistan army has been employing indirect tactics of targeting Baloch women to stifle the voice of freedom. Their regular abduction and subsequent violation has become a common phenomenon. More chilling and inhuman, however, is that this is being pushed as an agenda by the authorities. People from Punjab, no matter what profession they are pursuing, have been harassing the Baloch women. A report. The 
Baloch women are not just objectified, but they are subjected to traumatic experiences owing to a free hand provided to the regional conchos by the state masters sitting in Islamabad. Latest in the line of these regularly unfolding heinous cases against Baloch women cropped up in University of Balochistan, where Baloch students were secretly filmed by six cameras installed by people still unknown. And thanks to the shoddy investigation carried out by the agencies and political patronage, that these criminals are still roaming free. Several days have passed, judiciary has interfered, but no breakthrough has been achieved till date. This, however, is not new to Balochistan, where the locals are violently targeted for not towing the line of Pakistani army and state agencies. Baloch activists, who are forced to live away from their homeland, say that there is an agenda behind the systematic targeting of Baloch women. Pak state agencies have been using this trick to quash the Baloch movement. औरतों को जो उतार के ले जाने या और उनको फिर छोड़ने या कुछ को अपने पास रखने या उनके बच्चों को लेके जाना इससे ये जो है वो लाइक जंगी जो तरीके हैं वो इस्तेमाल करते हैं कि हम नफसियाती हवाले से बलूच इस स्ट्रगल को कमजोर करेंगे या बलूच जो फ्रीडम फाइटर्स हैं फ्रीडम स्ट्रगल कर रहे हैं उनको कमजोर करेंगे कि आप लोग अगर उस बात पे जाओगे आजादी की बात पे जाओगे तो हम एक्सट्रीम पे भी जा सकते हैं और जो सॉफ्ट टारगेट होते हैं वो बलूच बच्चे होते हैं और औरतें होते हैं जो घरों में रह रहे होते हैं और जिनके घर से कोई मर्द किसी ह्यूमन राइट्स स्ट्रगल में हो या पॉलिटिकल स्ट्रगल में हो उनको उठा के उनको सबक सिखाना चाहते हैं Pakistan's larger agenda seeks to control the Baloch people and they have been employing most illegal and inhuman techniques to achieve their goals. As per a report by Human Rights Council of Balochistan, 371 people have been disappeared and at least 158 have been killed by Pakistani security forces in the first 6 months of 2019 alone. and to everybody's shock major toll of the violence was taken by innocent baloch women government however has failed to do much in the case which the baloch accuse is deliberate as of march 2019 pakistan's commission of inquiry on enforced disappearances a state run agency had over 2000 unresolved cases of enforced disappearances The more strength the anti-Pakistan Baloch movement is gathering every day, more hardened the policy of repression has been made by Pakistan. Situation na bhi kafi bigger thi ja rahi hai. Even kuch ilakon mein is tarah ke cases hote hain, wahan report nahi hote. Family wale jo hain, wo chupate hain isi baat ko kyunki society mein unko ise wo nahi kar sakte open isi baat hain. To aise cases बहुत ज़्यादा रिकॉर्ड हो रहे हैं अब लाइक सॉफ्ट टारगेट के तौर पर बलूच तहरीक को कमज़ोर करने या उनको बलूच जो फ्रीडम के जो स्ट्रगल है उसको ब्लैकमेल करने के लिए इस तरह की हरकतें की जा रही हैं आर्मी की जानब से Since the day Balochistan was annexed and occupied by Pakistan in 1948, the Punjab run state has been plundering Balochistan's resources. Every day Baloch women are being beaten. tortured abducted and murdered in a pakistani army operation in balochistan the situation has worsened since the advent of cpec the china pakistan economic corridor the security agencies have been using brute force in order to pave way for the major economic projects under this flagship chinese project We are now joined by Munir Mengal, president of Voice Baloch Association, who will tell us more about the ground situation of Balochistan. So, Mr. Mengal, we have been hearing a lot about the atrocities being committed on Baloch by the Pakistani army and other state agencies. What is the ground reality? Actually, you know, the basic issue, human rights issues, is worsening over there on day by day basis. We hear news even today. We have got news that uh, two Baloch people have been kidnapped from. Turbat area. Yesterday there was a news that you know three guys were uh, kidnapped by the Pakistani army forces. 
and uh, just two three days earlier, uh, they received three dead bodies at one place and four dead bodies at Panjgur of the victims who were missing persons. So uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, the human rights abuses are increasing in Pakistan day by day, and the uh, Pakistani state uh, is using force without any fear. They are just killing the people. They have no mercy for the Baloch people. They know this thing that they have only one task to eliminate the people from their land. And for that, you know, they are doing every sort of tactics. Military operation, enforced disappearances, aerial bombardments. These are the daily activities which the Baloch people are seeing on their land by the state of, uh, by the hands of those state forces over there. Moving on. While billions of dollars need to be invested in order to restore the original beauty of water on Afghanistan, there are few examples that clearly testify the change country has witnessed since the ouster of the Taliban rule. Today we show you how the conservators are restoring the Buddhist artifacts and architecture that were turned to ruins during the Taliban rule. Conservators at the National Museum of Afghanistan are restoring the country's Buddhist history that the Taliban tried to erase. Taliban militant Islamic group went on a cultural rampage in 2001, destroying artifacts from as long ago as the 3rd century when many Afghans practiced Buddhism. The destruction that had been excavated from Buddhist monastery sites are now preserved at the Kabul Museum. The destruction included two towering Buddha statues in Bamiyan province. After the Taliban government fell, the same year the museum began restoring remnants of Afghanistan Buddhist history. <laughs> Sometimes, conservators work from archived photos that depict the statues intact. In other cases, 3D imaging and imagination are required to sort and reassemble stucco shards of Buddha faces, hands and torsos. Uh, restoration of our antiquity and our cultural heritage, whether it is uh, movable object in museums or immovable uh, monuments and the sites we are having all around Afghanistan, are uh, very important uh, for me also and also for the, uh, all people of Afghanistan and even the world. It's because uh, uh, this is part of history. Forty years of war from the 1980s Soviet occupation to internal fighting and the war against the Taliban have destroyed much of Afghanistan's art, artifacts and architecture. It's more than a thousand years that we had Buddhism in Afghanistan. Uh, but what important about uh, uh, the heritage of Buddhism in Afghanistan is actually it is uh, artistic work and also uh, how glorious uh, the monuments uh, and uh, the, the sites which currently remain for us from that uh, 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 period is uh, uh, actually uh, showing a very, very important part of that history. People, especially the students, who have deep interest in history believe that such sites should regularly be visited by the locals so that they can know about the history as well as the Taliban destruction. Madan ba museum bishar muhim az ba har fard Afghan ba khater ke as tarikh guzashte ma gosh ma zajdad wan yakan ma agash imkan hai chak san tarikh guzashte. 
people of Afghanistan are still navigating everyday Taliban violence, which has regained its position after the NATO forces left the country in combative roles and are there alongside the U.S. forces to just train and assist the Afghan security. While some believe that recently held presidential elections herald the beginning of the restoration of peace in the country, others are simply cynical of things ever restoring originality. Pakistan rakes up Kashmir and peddles lies about it whenever it gets an opportunity to interact with an international leader. However, all the leaders who anyway take its versions with a pinch of salt have rebuffed it. And why would they not? Islamabad's history and present reeks about its consistent support to terrorism. Today, however, we'll tell you about one additional component of embarrassment Pakistan has earned off late. The activists from illegally occupied POK have exposed Pakistan's tall claims of peace in the region. While they say India is developed and peaceful, a suppressive Islamabad-backed mechanism, according to them, has not just been checking the growth of the region, but has denied the fundamental rights to the common people. Pakistani leadership, which has seemingly mastered the art of manufacturing and propagating fake news, has been exposed yet again. And this time, by none other than the Kashmiris themselves, over whom it claims to have ownership and authority. Dr. Misper Hassan, a renowned voice on Kashmiri rights, accuses Pakistan of being suppressive and hypocritical. He denies Islamabad's tall claims of doing anything for the welfare of the region. In fact, he says, Pakistan has employed all the tools and tricks to further marginalize the people of the region. Pakistan, which has been talking about Kashmir and Kashmiris all around the globe, doesn't even allow the people of the region under illegal occupation to communicate with the rest of the world. The reason is quite simple. It fears being exposed. The that آئینی ایک قانونی اور ایک تاریخی مسئلہ ہے کشمیر کا اس پر جذبات سے کھیلنا جس طرح سے ستر سالوں سے ہوتا آ رہا ہے اس سے کوئی مسئلہ حل ہونے والا نہیں ہے اور بند دروازوں کے پیچھے جو باتیں وہ کرتے ہیں اور جو باتیں وہ پبلک کے سامنے آ کے کرتے ہیں اس میں بہت بڑا تضاد ہے اور اس کی وجہ سے ہم سمجھتے ہیں کہ ان کے جو نیت ہے وہ ٹھیک نہیں ہے اور اگر ان کی نیت ٹھیک ہوتی تو وہ اپنے علاقے کے جو اپنے زیر انتظام جو کشمیر کے علاقے تھے اس کی ایک حکومت موجود تھی صدر اور وزیر اعظم تھا ہم ان سے انیس سو باسٹھ سے مطالبہ کر رہے ہیں کہ آپ ہمیں یہاں سے آزادی دیں آپ ہماری حکومت کو نمائندہ حکومت تسلیم کر لیں تاکہ ہم باقی دنیا سے بات چیت کے ذریعے اور افہام و تفہیم کے ساتھ کوئی ایسا حل تلاش کریں کہ جو ساری طاقتوں کے لیے سارے جو پلیئرز ہیں جن کو جو اس میں انوالو ہیں چاہے مسلمان ہیں چاہے غیر مسلم ہیں سب کے حقوق کی بات کرتے ہوئے کوئی ایسا حل تلاش کریں کہ جس سے خطے کے اندر امن پیدا ہو اور اس سے خطے کی ڈیولپمنٹ ہو لیکن ابھی تک ہم اس میں کامیاب نہیں ہو سکیں دا ریجن ہیز بین ان شیمبلس فار دا لاسٹ سیون ڈیکیڈس دا پیپل ہیئر لٹرلی ڈونٹ نو واٹ اے ڈیولپ سوسائٹی اور ریجن اپیئرز لائک دی بینیفٹ آف دا لٹل اماؤنٹ آف ورک ڈن ایٹ دا پریٹیکس آف ڈیولپمنٹ has been consumed by the diabolic duo of the Pakistani army and the civil establishment. People have not been accorded even the basic rights and facilities. Pakistan has also tried to twist facts and spread rumors that the state of Jammu and Kashmir has poor infrastructure and system. But to its dismay, Even this is known to the people that it has been misruling for more than seven decades. I haven't been to the Indian side yet. But I have heard from the people, some of our friends who went there, I have heard their stories and stories about the colleges, universities and other things that our friends who are living there are living here. تو وہ کہتے ہیں کہ کوئی اس کا مقابلہ نہیں ہے اس طرف بہت زیادہ ڈیولپمنٹ ہوئی ہے بہت زیادہ ترقی ہوئی ہے نسبتاً پاکستان والی سائڈ کے ملٹیپل پروٹیسٹ ڈیمانڈنگ فریڈم فرام دا کلچرز آف پاکستان وہ ہیلتھ ان پی او کے 
after the government of India decided to get rid of an article to merge the state of Jammu and Kashmir with rest of the country. A baffled Pakistan unleashed mayhem on Kashmiris. It framed multiple youths and sent them behind the bars. A peaceful demand for freedom was once again crushed. However, the Kashmiris look determined this time. They have smelled an opportunity and they say they are ready to go to any extent to gain freedom from Pakistan. Moving on to Himachal Pradesh in India that recently got soaked in the festivities of international Kullu Dashera Utsav. Held in the peaceful slope town of Kullu, the festival is a perfect mix of rich culture, history and ritual and is observed after the Dashera festivities culminate in the whole country. Known for its beautiful gorges, chatty mountain streams and ancient temples, Kullu certainly enthralls the visitors during its Dashera festival, also regarded as International Kullu Dashera Utsav. With music and colour creating a beautiful ambience, the first day of the festival begins with members of the former royal family of Kullu performing their annual rituals and offering prayers to Hindu god and goddesses. After that, the procession of Lord Raghunath or Lord Ram starts, alongside different local deities carried on the chariot over the town. The festival dates back to 17th century when Raja Jagat Singh was the erstwhile ruler of the valley. As per the legend, he carried the idol of Lord Raghunath Ji from Ayodhya to Kullu in order to get rid of the curse put on him by a peasant. After that, in order to honour Lord Raghunath, he invited the local deities which then became a tradition. This year, more than 331 deities were invited to Raghunath Rath Yatra, who accompanied the chariot of the chief deity. Lakhs of people from across the country and outside attended the festival to experience the richness of Himachali culture and traditions. I find this festival so interesting. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. All of the colour, all of the music, uh, it's, it's amazing. The following days of the festival too are celebrated with immense joy and enthusiasm. Cultural troops from different parts of the country as well as from outside are invited to perform at the festival. This year, Foreign troops from Russia, Malaysia and Sri Lanka mesmerized the spectators with their performance. The lovely climate and amazing magnificence of the valley alongside stunning performance by the artists fill the guests with unceasing bliss and fulfillment. Uh, we came here to perform in Kullu festival, Kullu Dasahara festival and this is our fourth time in India. We have been few countries uh, before and uh, this platform and especially this is a very uh, useful platform to all of cultural things because there are so many cultural performance, cultural foods and everything. Uh, so uh, as, uh, as Sri Lanka and uh, I think there are so many countries performing here in this platform, so it is very urgent, very useful uh, for cultural sharing. The biggest highlight of the festival was the folk dance Kulluvi Nati that was performed by around 4,000 ladies this year. Kullu Dashera represents the centuries-old tradition of the town and his much anticipated and commended celebration that marks the triumph of good over evil. The Kullu Dashera festival was announced as a universal celebration in 1972 and since then it is visited by the people from across the globe. With that, we come to the end of this week's episode. See you next week. Goodbye and take care.